Now, Rosaline, you're going to be 90, so you've lived nine decades. Um, tell me where you were born and reared. What, what part of Donegal were you born and reared in? I was born in Rafo. Um, nearly 90 years ago. <laughs> uh, Ailey Street, the name we were reared. And it was a very quiet town then. There was actually no uh, electricity. And the street lights were uh, powered by a private company that was uh, based in a at Moffat's at Rape Place, like uh, mach, uh, machines, and that was the, the, light, the street light, and there were no electricity in the houses. It was all uh, oil lamps, or as they called them, tele lamps, which hang from a ceiling. And then, of course, was candles. And I remember in some houses, <laughs> the candles would have been in the bedroom, and sometimes the person would have would have fallen asleep in the candles then the curtains went up flames. Uh, and uh, the schools were very very primitive really. There was um, there was no heating in them, it was a big long classroom but it, there was an old fireplace and they used to light the fire in it every day. But we had to bring uh, turf or something uh, uh, blocks or whatever each week to, to for the fire and each class was taken up in their turn around the fire so the schools were very cold with big high ceilings in them the classroom and all there were about three or four different classes in the one room because there was only two two big rooms between the schools there was a, and the, one on the other side and that was the infants and, and junior infants and second class, and the others were the older ones. So that was that was all the room they had, really. And there was no running water or anything in the schools, and they were very cold. And there were no school buses. I remember a family from near, well, out convoy, really, uh, uh, Smiley Spray they called it and they used to have to walk every morning into school hail, rain or snow there was another family Devines out from Carnoan their nearest school would have been Castle Fun or Rafoe was the nearest so they had to walk from, from Carnoan to Rafoe and back out again and then there was a, and some people were very poor I remember um, family down well it would be Hani and and they used to have to bring a lunch with them. I remember they up, the, the teacher would have brought us up around the fire every class for to get the heat. And there was one young fella, I remember his name was Brennan, I think, and he just collapsed at my feet. And that was with pure hunger. All he had with him that day was a bottle of cold tea. I don't even know if he had any bread or anything with him. It was so sad. And they had a walk from the school right down to Mary Han again in the evening. How far would that be? That would be about, that would be two over two miles from here down there. To, uh, hail, rain or snow, they had to go. And uh, the teachers, they had just two classrooms. You know, just two teachers, one on one side of the school and the other and the other side, you know, and there were all the first class, second class were all in one room and then the older class were in the other room. And you often wonder back, how did they do it? They used to bring each class up, teacher would have been up, at the, they had an open fire, and the teacher would have been up, and each class was brought up, round, stand around the fire, and then that's how they got their lesson then. He asked them questions. Everybody had to answer questions uh, up at the fireplace. And then <laughs> it was so funny because you, you had to be there to have nine. 
And if you weren't in at half nine, the master McGlinchey closed the door, barred the door inside, so you didn't get in. You had to sit in the hall until 11 o'clock, until that was the break, and he came out with a big rod, and everybody got that, that hadn't been there in the morning had to put out their hand for this slap with the big rod. And they used the cane, I suppose, for all yeah, it was, sorts? Uh, we used to say it was a sally rod, they called it then. Yeah. So if you weren't there in time, you got the sally rod. And what about things like if you got subjects, something wrong, spellings wrong, did they slap you as well? Do what? When you would get a spelling wrong or a test wrong, did they use the cane? On Not the really. No, no. No, no. They didn't do it for that at all. But the... We didn't have a lot of Irish here, you know, and uh, it was very difficult, you know, because one of the teachers didn't really have great Irish. She was from Roscommon, uh, Miss Kerrigan was her name, and then Master McGlinchey was on the other side. And, uh, it was, you know, it, it was strange because we used to have scholarships to St. Eunice College, and I remember one of the local fellows uh, won a scholarship to St. Eunice, but he couldn't go because the family couldn't afford to buy him clothes, the uniform. They couldn't afford it. You had to pay for it then, but they couldn't afford it, so he didn't get it. So it was very sad, too, you know, in those days. Um, and I suppose there was no... Outs, the toilets, were they outside the toilets of the school? The toilets? Oh, yes, there were dry toilets outside, way at the bottom of the play place, you know. And there was no running water either inside the school or anywhere. And um, as I say, I used to feel sorry for people that had to walk long distance in the morning. And mind you, a lot of them never must hail rain or snow that were there. And what about the house that you grew up in yourself? What kind of a house was that and who was in the house? Who who was with you when you were growing up? Uh, I, well, it was a small house, but it was a comfortable house, you know. And we used to have a range in the kitchen, like it's quite warm. And then you had, like, what they call, like, a, a parlour. And then off that was a little bedroom. And then there was, behind the kitchen, there was a range in the kitchen. And then behind that was like a little scullery that was out to the back. And then there was the stairs upstairs. And upstairs there were just two bedrooms upstairs, you know. But they were, they were quite comfortable because they were all, the floors were all wooden, you know. So they were quite, uh, you know, comfortable and dry. There was no damp, you know. But you had no electricity. It was oil lamps, the tele lamps, I call them, you used to hang from the ceiling, or candles. Yeah. And, and many was in the house with you, brothers and sisters? Oh, well, I had only one brother and one sister, but they were a lot older than me. My sister was 11 years older than me, so they were kind of growing up when I was small, you know. And like, I suppose Brady was like mother. She, she used to do all that kind of work, you know. But my mother, in her younger days, she was from Kelly Garden, they had a kind of a little industry. What they used to do, you know the linen cloths, that the, the white linen uh, work, that you know, the embroidery work, but it was linen. They did that. Her and their sister, there only two of them, there were no brothers, and they, they um, provided it to a, a shop in Ballard Buffet. I cannot remember the name of the shop, it should have, but they sold linen tablecloths, and that was where the, the embroidery on those cloths were done, they done that. So it was a kind of a great talent, you know. I mean, I, I, I had a christening uh, little gown that she had done. Of course, somebody borrowed, and I never got it back. And I wasn't too happy about that, you know, because it was lovely. 
But that's what they did then in those days, you know, for their land. But, I mean, she was showing me some lovely stuff that they had done. Beautiful, you know, and it was all for, probably for um, entertaining and, and big castles and places like that, you know, that's what it was for. It was linen, then with the hand um, embroidered around it, but there wasn't what the embroidery we would think of now coloured. It wasn't at all white, like lace, you know, it's all like lace, uh, it's lovely. But she didn't keep it up. She did she used a few things for me. I think she did a christening, a little christening jacket, as I told you. I never got it back. And what did your father do? Well, in, in the early years, he, had a, he drove the priest. I, I never knew how... I, I, no, it, in those days, there was a pony and trap that the priest had. So it was a parish priest up here in Rafaux that he was drive. It was a Canon Blake. And then he was transferred to a place called Don Fanny. And he took my father with him. And they graduated to buying a motor car. I never knew, I probably heard it, who taught my father to drive the car. But that was in the very, you know, early years before he was married. And he was able to drive the car, and there were very few people had cars in them days. And, uh, and your your um, mother and father would have lived through the War of Independence. Oh yes, and the Civil War. They did indeed. Did they talk much about it? Well, our house was one of them houses that political house. Would you believe it? And it was called a doll, if you don't mind. And everybody gathered there. Including Dr. Irwin, who lived in this house. Uh, he enjoyed the political arguments. And uh, there was a man, Mick McGeehan, who lived down, we call it down the Glen, or Foe. And there was a, a shooting one night over where, over where the banks are, where Barry McCarran at the butcher shop. There was a man shot there. And Mick McGeehan was supposed to have been the person who had the gun. And it happened then that he was in our house. And therefore my mother and father had to go to Dublin to a trial. That did they see him with a gun in, in our house? And they couldn't say they did. Because, you know, he didn't, he didn't show it, but, but he was in our house before that man was shot. And that would have been uh, an argument about pro-treaty and anti-treaty? Oh, it was politics, aye, surely, it was surely. And he did time. And uh, my mother and father had to go to Dublin. They were never out of a foe in their life. And they had to go to this trial and they were all put up in Jury's Hotel. They were in Jury's Hotel before we ever knew where it was. And... Uh, it was very, very stressful for them, you know. I think, uh, you know, because they were questioned very, very, what do you call it, severe questioning about the whole thing. And uh, McGeehan did do time, so he did. And uh, then when he came back, I remember my first election. Y you didn't have a vote until you were 21 then. The guy wasn't married then. And uh, I had my first vote. And he was working at the school, which, you know, still work at the school. But he followed me down into the very booth, it was my first time to vote, in case that I would vote for De Valera. He came round in behind where I was voting. You wouldn't get doing that nowadays. So your parents were pro-treaty? Oh, yes, yes, very much. Michael Collins, very much Collins people. Yeah. So, um, as I say, Mike McGeehan made sure that I didn't vote for De Valera anyway. And what do you remember them talking about the Civil War or about Michael Collins and De Valera? Do you remember much of, of what your parents their, their thoughts or their opinions at the time? Well, not really. Be well, you see, it was very, 
a very bad time because there was, there was a curfew and the lights were all put out here at night on the streets. And uh, although my father, one night, he would drive Dr. Irwin, lived in this house, and they must have been out on a case. And the guys that were on the street, were they, were they black and tans? You know. Uh, he was nearly shot. But nobody was supposed to be on with curfew, but the doctor was allowed out. But they never checked that. And he was nearly shot that time. Oh, it was very scary, you know. But, um... And this town itself that you grew up in was quite predominantly a Protestant town. So do you remember much... Um, opinions as you were growing up about you know pro-treaty or anti-treaty or wanting to be part of the British or part of Northern Ireland as it became? Not really you know no people after that people seemed to settle down to what what was to be uh, but and in, in, uh, there was a lot of poor people in those days and there was no such thing as Social welfare benefits like they get now. There was nothing really. They called it. There was a kind of some kind of a scheme, but and they used to get their beef, and the beef had been free, and so they used to call them the free beefers. And I, my mother, said, Are you getting some of that beef? No, no, no. She said, I wouldn't. She wouldn't take it. Why would she not take it? Because it was um, how do you call it? Auntie Collins, like. That was De Valeria was providing Davy, Davy's beef, they called it. So she would know, she would, she would have starved for it. <laughs> and where, um, as you were growing up, I mean, was there, a, a, you said that there was a lot of poverty in, in the town. You know, how did people manage for, for money? How did, what did people do for Yeah, they were, but, but the Conboy Woolen Mills was going then. And a lot of people from here worked on it. And it was a great boost, you know. And then, of course, this area is a very big farming area. You know, it would have been a rich farming area. So there weren't that many very poor people. As I say, the Conway One Mill provided a lot of um, employment and people cycled from here out to it. There were no buses to take them. But they didn't mind, and they, they earned good money. And in the Conway Woolen Mills, what they did do, they made the material that made the Garda uniforms and the Army uniforms. That's what was made in Conway Woolen Mill in those days. A beautiful tweed material. Anybody that worked there was able to get, we'll say if you wanted to get a coat, somebody to make you a coat, you could get the material from from the factory, but unless you worked there, you know, you wouldn't get it. They didn't, didn't have a shop or anything. It was beautiful Donegal tweed, and they made it in Convoy Mill, called Convoy Woolen Mill. It's very famous. I think it's a kind of a centre now, out there, you know. But um, And people didn't really go on to secondary school, did they, many people? Well, well it was because you, there were scholarships, now, I knew one family, I knew them, they were, that he won a scholarship, but couldn't go to St. Julian's because they couldn't afford to buy the uniform, which was very sad. Did you go to secondary school or to... Or I, yeah, I went to Letter Kenny. But, I mean, that was, that was a good bit later on, you know, because uh, the fellow that must out to been a good bit older than me but he, he couldn't get, was a, they couldn't afford to pay. You had to buy the uniform and you had to pay for the books. So now, I mean, they were, now they're privileged now because they can get everything. Do you remember uh, your parents talking at all about the bad flu that happened in the 1918, 1990? I very, very vaguely, but I remember my mother talking about uh, a man down here, his name was Paddy Brawley. He was married to my aunt. 
and he was a very successful business in his own business and he took uh, a flu or pneumonia and in those days there were no antibiotics and my mother I remember her tell they set up with him and made what they called a pulses to put on the lungs to try and clear it but he died and Cassie was left with a big house full of children. And in those days, there were no children's allowance or anything. for. But her brother came back. He was in the First World War. He came back and he stayed with her. He wasn't married. So he would have had a good pension from the British Army. You know, so he stayed with her. But it was very sad because he had, he had an undertaking business before he got the flu. And the family were all too small to um, to take it over. They were too young, you know. But she was a great woman herself, you know. So you um, you remember, I suppose, then you would remember the the Second World War here, living in Rafaux. You were on the border, so there would have been British soldiers and. Uh, maybe Americans. I across will, the funny thing about it, uh, the, the, that the soldiers were able to come across Lefford Bridge to Lefford, and they spent most of their time in Hearts Bar in Lefford, and they used to buy meat in the butcher shop to take back with them to their headquarters. You know, they were able to walk freely over and back. And American soldiers as well were based in Derry, you see. And your daddy used to talk about uh, a couple of the American soldiers that they made friends with and kept in touch with them after they went back to America. You know, and uh, but Lifford really thrived at that stage because they had that flow of, of money coming into them. And they were buying their meat and all. You know, they came across from Strabane to buy that, you know. And there was a railway station in Rafaux? There was, yes. You could get the train to Letterkenny or to Strabane. And then if you want the train to Strabane, you could change to another platform and you've got a um, train to Derry or Belfast or Dublin. You just changed. And one of, one of the main trains went... And when it came to Portadown, part of few were going to Belfast, it went, and the other part went on to Dublin. It was so funny, you know, it divided, the train divided, and one was able to go that to, to Belfast, and the other was able to go to Dublin. Do you think that was a big loss? Oh, train? it was, surely. The railway was a big loss. I mean, you could go to another Straban, went on the train to Derry, you could have went to Dublin. You went to Belfast, and you know the train is so different, it's so comfortable. You could have sat in the train, and you you know they had a, a, a like a tea. You could have you could have had some deet on it. You know, lovely to be laying a little table with white tablecloths and everything on the train, and it was lovely. But that all uh, they blamed Iskell Childers for closing down the railways when he became Minister for Transport. He was to blame for closing them, which was a shame. You met your husband? On yes. The I, uh, Tell he, me about that. He, he was in St. Eunan's and, of course, himself and his brother, Jim, and he wouldn't, they wouldn't stay in St. Eunan's. He always wanted to be a butcher. So, of course, his father said, right, if you're going to be a butcher, you'll have to be properly trained because the hearts weren't trained. They just inherited from grandfather down, but they weren't trained. And he said, well, you have to be trained properly if you're going to be a butcher. So he was sent then to Patterson's and Larry Kenny. That was a big um, butcher uh, outfit then in those days. And uh, I used to be on the train in the morning, and then I was going to school uh, in Larry Kenny at the time. And that's how I met him. But gosh, the half of Rafa was on the train. I wasn't the only one. And a lot of the, a lot of the people that were going to St. Eunan's went on the train from Rafa. To school. To school. And um, I mean, girls that were in the class with me, we all went to Larry Kenny. You know, because 
The only, the only secondary school here was the Royal School. And then not many people went to it, you know, but uh, they all ended up in Leonard County. So what age were you when you got married? I would have been 21, 22. Uh, yeah. And your daddy was the same age. Uh, and so where did you live when you got married? We lived in Rafo for a while. No, we didn't. We went to Kula Tea, that was it. We lived there for a while and then your daddy. And where is, where is Kula Tea? Down in the house in Kula Tea, down at, out at, out at, it was smoky as they call it, at the top of the place. And, and we, out there, that was the townland, Kula Tea, but that's where their house was. And it was just called Kula Tea. And the reason it was called Kula Tea was the house was actually two houses. The man that owned it, in fact, my father knew him. It was it was a, an ordinary house, and the back of, the front of it was at the back, and he was a, a captain on some ship, so he decided to build on two big front rooms because he entertained her, and that was the two front rooms that you'd see when you were driving down into Coolity. wasn't part of the old house at all, so when you went in the front door. There were stairs going up, and then there were stairs going down into the kitchen. Because they thought, well, the servants used them stairs in them days. There was big, there was that was kind of, and there was two big rooms. One was the drawing room, and one was the dining room. They were never used only at Christmas time, because downstairs then there was a kitchen, like the farmers, um, farmyard kitchen, and then there was a little room off it. And that's where you used to sit, you know, there was like a little sitting room just. And then below that there was a bedroom downstairs. And it was uh, it was a very nice house, but it was very cold. Was in those days there was no central heating. But the kitchen was, they had a Rayburn kitchen, Rayburn cooker in the kitchen. And, and that was, it was really, really cold now in those days. It was all, flat, floors were all... Cement, you know. And you then came to live in this in house in Rafo now, where you live? Uh, yeah. We didn't, we didn't live there that long until this house here. Well, your father maintained, he wanted to open in the diamond. He was down there, to call it the top of the glen. That's where he started out. But he, he was aiming to get to the diamond. So this house then came up for sale. And Dr. Hamilton was emigrating to uh, Canada and came up for sale. And it was lying for a long time before anybody was interested in it. And eventually your father, said, the bank manager said to your father, that was it, there's a house now for you in the Diamond. You wanted to move. I always said, I couldn't afford to buy that house. I'd be far too dear. Well, he was a bank manager. So he... He said, oh, not be that bad, you not be that bad. Anyway, he talked to Monty buying it. And I remember we were done here. He had opened the business. And at that particular time, he was selling very high-class meat. But didn't the price of the cattle go up? But he couldn't put the price of the beef up because he'd only started the business and everybody was coming to this great meat, lovely meat, you know, this top-class meat. So he lost a lot of money at that time. He used to come in here and he'd say, oh, this house is too dear. I'll not be able to keep this house now. But anyway, we soldiered on. There were nothing in it but beds and cots. <laughs> you had nine children? Yes, aye. But there were seven for a long time, you know. I mean, my age was rushing when uh, Ethna was born and Johnny, like she was, they were away, you were away at school then, yeah. Was it difficult rearing a lot of children? It wasn't really because I always had a girl working here, you know. Uh, and it wasn't, no, no you, you see, you, you had, uh, well, you had a big garden, you know, and you had plenty of room upstairs as well. 
And then there was one of the rooms who, which was lying empty because we couldn't afford to furnish it. And it was kind of like a playroom. So everybody ended up on there. You know, and the, the front one was where the doctor had a surgery in it. So it, at the end, we read that it became the sitting room. And this was the kitchen. Um, that was the kitchen there. And out, out where the coats are now, you went through there, and that's where the... The small kitchen was, that's where the Aga cooker was out there, and it was only a table, and then it was all the presses, like, round the back, round the door. There was no presses in here. This was a kind of, well, living room, dining room, because you, there was no room out at the place to eat, so you had to eat in here. It must have been a very busy house then. I suppose it was, really, aye. There was always somebody going and coming, and there was always a baby here, and... And uh, as they had a girl, a very nice girl, Rose Lynch, working here, and uh, when you were all small, and she pitches, Rose would have went up to bed at night, pitches the bed, and you'd end up looking and say, Well, Rose, Rose would have been lying up sleeping beside you. <laughs> so then uh, Paddy became a politician, became a member of the All Aaron. Aye, that's right. That was when we only started the butcher business here. And he, he was asked to stand for the council, but he was reluctant, but he said only because his father had stood for the council and didn't get elected. And he thought, well, I'll just stand for the council uh, for my father. Father had died at 45. So he did that and got elected to the council, and that, that was that, of course. But they kept coming back and back and back and said, no, you have to stand now for the daughter. He said, no, no, I'm not standing for the daughter because I'm only after buying myself a house and opening a business. I just cannot get involved in politics. And they kept coming back and coming back and coming back and eventually said, well, I'll stand for the council, but that's it. And he did stand for the council in the honour of his father just but he couldn't get elected. And after he was elected, and after that, then, of course, the pressure then was on then. Dan McMenamin was the TD then, and Dan McMenamin was going to retire. And he used to come here, you know, like he used to go to Hearts and Lefford long before we were involved, or before your father was involved. They always called it, it was one of the Fine Gael houses. And he would have called there. So naturally enough, your father was earmarked then at that, but all. he didn't want to go at all. No way did he want to. And remember, the, the, he just, the butcher shop here had just opened. And, um, and they had put the pressure on him to stand for the council. And I remember out in the diamond, there was a platform, he was not. And this place in here was, wasn't was ready really at that time. Uh, it was in the process of being made into a shop. And it ended up that night, it was a bar that night. That was the lady who was elected first to the all? To the, no, the council. Yeah. So then, of course, he got back into the work again, the business, and they kept coming after him to stop the door. I said, no way. He says, I'm only after buying a house. I'm only after starting my own business. I cannot walk away and leave that. And then somebody said, I bet, you know, you could still do that and you still have an extra salary. There wasn't the same pressure, you know, in the politics in those days. That was mostly council work, you know, your more local work. But then I'm trying to think, Ethna wasn't born when he was selected for the doll. She wasn't. And, uh, so when he was elected, there was a, a member of the first doll just a few doors down. I P.J. Ward just lived down two door, three doors down there. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, do you remember even the, the connection with P.J. Ward and the very first doll and the... the yeah. Well, I knew him long before I knew your father. I knew the wards, like, because they were under foe. You know, and he was a very nice man, yeah. But he, he, once he was out, he, he just took no interest in politics. So he didn't. He just retired completely. And he went on to play in golf. That was his thing then. 
He didn't get involved at all. No. What was it like for you as the wife of a politician for the best part of 37 years? Well, I mean, you had to get used to it. It's going to be your livelihood now. You're not, you're not going to have anything else. But in those days, you see, there was no such thing as having their office, having their own office. It was all in here. And there, came, there was a clinic on a Saturday morning. You know, and people would have come to the house on a Saturday. But the phone never stopped either, it was busy, because there probably hadn't anybody in those days. I mean, Neil Blaney, well, he didn't live here. You know, he lived away down in Fannet, wherever they were from, you know, that time. And then the other man was none shown. But it was a very funny Fianna Fáil county in those days. You know, there was always... Two ministers, really, you know. So it was uh, difficult being Finne Gael. Oh, yeah. Uh, it wasn't easy, you know. Uh, Fianna Fáil had a, had a very strong uh, hold here. And I remember a man named Jerry Cashin saying to your daddy, he was a rep for some big company, he used to come to Donegal. He said, I don't, I, I'm wondering how did you get elected as a Fine Gael to such a Fianna Fáil county. You know, and it was very Fianna Fáil, because you would have two ministers. You had Liam Cunning was a minister, Neil Blaney was a minister, Joe Brennan was a minister, Carmick Bresson was the last can call you. You know, it was the can call you. So they were very strong in this county. So they were. So it was a battle, but in a show in one place it was neglected by Fine Gael. So your daddy, he decided then that he was going to sh and shown and start branches. And he opened branches in every town and then shown. You know, and then in the Milford area as well. And every month he had a different place to go to every month and have clinics. And nobody had ever started that before. He also had to go to Dublin, drive to Dublin. Oh, they had to go time. to Dublin. They sat on a Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday, so you didn't get back until maybe late Thursday night or Friday. You know, so then it was a busy Friday and Saturday, people coming to the house. And the phone, of course, was busy, busy phone. Here, sitting there. You remember that? Uh, so, and it was a long drive to Dublin in those days. Oh, it was, surely, aye, it was. But, um, and then at the beginning he went, he used to go with Pal Donnell. Pa was, was um, he was a TD then for the West. The constituency was, was, was divided then, and Pa was for the West, the county. And then Dan McMenamin, who had been before your daddy, he was for this end of the county. So Pa was very good to your daddy, you know, helped him out a lot when he was elected first. And actually Pa persuaded him to go to, you know, but, uh, you know, he was interested in politics, but he never saw himself as being a full-time politician. He was more interested in running the business, you know. But then politics, it becomes an obsession. It takes over your life, really. You couldn't have run a business and have a politics. You couldn't do it. You know, so there wasn't I, a lot of money in it then either. No, the salary was a thousand a year, and I remember when he was elected for. I mean, he said, "Oh, sure, it'll be an extra thousand a year," and like he, he made more money in the butchering business than he did in politics. Never made any money in politics because the salary wasn't good. No, wasn't. and there were no secretaries. Oh, not at all. No secretaries. Um, I don't, I don't, I think they got so many expenses, but not a lot. Hello. Not a lot, no. And uh, so now you're he heading into your 90th year and you're living through a pandemic. Yes. So what's your thoughts about that, about what life is like now compared to your long life? You know, the, the, the way well, life is now. I mean, it's... people are very well off now, really. You know, there were no such thing as children's allowance. Or there were no such thing as medical cards. 
you know, and people getting part of their rent paid. It wasn't, the people were very poor. And I remember there was a kind of satellite tenants living the way up the top of A Street. And I remember my mother carrying towels and sheets and things. And I used to wonder, I was quite young, where was she going, what was she doing? Probably when some of the children were born, like, she went up to them and brought clothes up to them, you know. And what are your thoughts about the pandemic, about the virus? No. Yes. Well, it's quite serious for people, uh, especially people who are working and have a business, and for young people. It's, I mean, you'd like to see some kind of a vaccine coming to, to clear it up, because it's not easy for people who are running a business. And how has it affected you, yourself? Me? Well, at my age now, she <laughs> wouldn't matter. <laughs> You're not feeling the effects. I just, I just stay in, cocooning as I say. <laughs> I don't go out at all. That's the best way, keep away from the street. And do you miss seeing children and grandchildren? I mean, you must sign, you must go up to, up to Paddy Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> and McGranahan's and Barclays, you know, those places were all, you always went somewhere every day, you know. Up as Jack Madden used to say, or with Peter as well, if you're in this house, we have to go up the street. But they couldn't understand this. But in Dublin, the streets would have been all different streets. They took up the street, and that was us up the street. Are you looking forward to celebrating your 90th birthday? Cocooned? <laughs> I know. There'll not be much celebrating. <laughs> when we get fish and chips. 